first video on inflation, we defined inflation, showed how to calculate it, and distinguish between the different causes of inflation, including demand pull and cost push inflation. In this lesson, we're going to focus on some of the consequences of inflation and talk about some possible solutions to inflation without going into too much detail into the different types of policies a government can use, as these are topics covered in later lessons. As you can see in the graph on the right here, inflation exists whenever there is an increase in aggregate demand causing a movement along the short run aggregate supply curve or when there is a decrease in aggregate supply causing a movement along the aggregate demand curve. In both cases, price levels rise causing several consequences for different stakeholders in the economy. The first consequence that I'd like to discuss is the impact that inflation has on investors and households and businesses when it comes to their confidence or certainty about the economy. So high inflation can create an environment of uncertainty. So what does this mean? This could lead to low levels of foreign investment as foreign firms that might want to build factories in your country might expect prices to rise for raw materials, for labor, for all sorts of the costs of producing in the country. Low foreign investment could mean less economic growth. Domestic firms uncertain about the future prices at which they'll be able to sell their goods might cut back on investment as well. So inflation could create an environment where there is less incentive for firms to invest, both foreign and domestic. This could slow economic growth in the long run. Next, let's talk about the impact on savers. Imagine you have $1,000 in the bank growing at an interest rate of 2% per year. As long as the inflation rate is less than 2% and the purchasing power of your savings will increase over time and you will be getting wealthier over time. However, due to the effect that inflation has on the real interest rate, savers are actually harmed. The real interest rate takes into account the impact that inflation has on the value of money over time. If you're saving money at 2% and inflation rises to 3%, the real interest rate is actually the nominal rate minus the inflation rate. Now, what are savers looking for? They're looking for a good interest rate on their savings. If inflation rises, then the real rate of interest decreases and savings is wiped out by high inflation. Now, as long as inflation is kept low and stable, interest rates tend to be higher than inflation rates and the value of people's savings increases over time. But if inflation increases at a high rate, such as that which we see in our graph here on the right, this can lead to a decrease in the real interest rate and lower valued savings among the nation's households over time. So let's continue down that line of thought. If savings is being wiped out by inflation, this creates an incentive for households to actually spend money. So lower value savings over time leads households to want to spend more now. In other words, consumption increases when there is inflation. Now this may sound like a good thing. More consumption in the short term means more jobs, more demand, more employment for the nation's workers. However, more consumption during a period of high inflation can actually fuel more inflation. This could lead to an inflationary spiral where rising prices create an incentive for households to spend more and that increased spending leads to ever increasing prices. Eventually, higher prices lead to higher wages and this causes cost push inflation on top of the demand pull inflation. So we can say the demand pull leads to cost push inflation. A country trapped in an inflationary spiral is in desperate shape. It means that prices are only going to continue to rise due to the expectation of rising prices and the impact that that has on households and incentive to consume rather than save. Another additional negative impact of high inflation is the impact on exports. A country's exports are only attractive to foreigners if they can be purchased at reasonable prices. So inflation raises the prices of a country's exports to foreigners. This reduces the attractiveness of exports on the global market. Inflation can reduce the competitiveness of domestic firms in the global market for their goods. For this reason and the others outlined here, inflation can have several negative effects on society. So does anybody benefit from inflation? Are there any winners? 
there is one particular group of people that might actually benefit from inflation, and that is people who have debt or organizations that have debt or even a government that has debt. So we can say debtors, um, individuals, firms, or governments with high levels of debt could actually benefit from inflation. Now, why is that? It's because inflation decreases the real values of debt. Inflation means the value of money is decreasing over time. The money that debtors repay is worth less than the money they borrowed. So does this mean that inflation is good for society? Well, clearly there are more losers than there are winners. While those who have borrowed a lot of money and have to repay it may benefit in regards to the fact that they're paying back money that's worth less than the money they borrowed, the fact is even people with debt also have savings. So those very same winners might also be losers. Not to mention the effect that inflation has on uncertainty and business confidence. The reduction of business investment and foreign investment could harm those very same people that have high levels of debt. So this all leads us to the section of our lesson on solutions. I should point out once again that not all inflation is bad. The goal, of course, is low and stable inflation. Generally, central banks and policymakers target an inflation rate of 2 to 3 percent. Anything above this is considered dangerously high. I should also point out that I'm referring to more developed countries when I talk about the 2 to 3 percent inflation target. Less developed countries with higher economic growth rates should expect to live with higher inflation rates as well. However, 2 to 3 percent inflation is a range that instills confidence and certainty among households and firms. Uh, this also incentivizes investment and consumption. But not too much, which could lead to an inflationary spiral. So the goal, of course, is not to eliminate all inflation, rather to keep inflation low between 2 and 3%. So what policies could be used to bring down an inflation rate that is higher than 2 or 3%? Now, later in the course, we're going to focus on different macroeconomic policies in much more detail. But right now, I'm just going to point out some obvious ones. And we, we can use terms like contractionary demand side policies. These are policies that reduce the level of aggregate demand, such as higher taxes, reduced government spending, or higher interest rates, which incentivizes savings and disincentivizes consumption and investment. Contractionary demand side policies have the effect of reducing the level of aggregate demand in the economy to bring down the inflation rate resulting from demand pull inflation. So we can see the effect that that would have brings the inflation rate back down closer to the desired inflation rate of 2 to 3% and keeps output closer to the full employment level. This is a way to slow down an overheating economy. What about cost push inflation? Contractionary demand side policies aren't very useful during a period of cost push inflation. As we can see, if we had cost push inflation moving from here to here, along the AD curve, a contractionary demand side policy could bring down the inflation rate, reducing AD to AD3, but this would come at the expense of output and employment. This could move an economy that was already experiencing stagflation, that's stagnant growth and high inflation, into even more stagnant growth or a recession. So Y3 would create a recessionary gap. Clearly, contractionary demand side policies can make the unemployment problem resulting from cost push inflation even worse. So what's needed is expansionary supply side policies, policies that increase aggregate supply following a cost push inflation and bring the inflation rate back down. Yes, my graph is getting very cluttered here. I apologize for that. But you get the idea. A policy that can increase short run aggregate supply can counteract the effects of cost push inflation. So the final solution we're going to outline here and introduce is expansionary supply side policies. These are policies aimed at reducing costs of production for firms. This could mean lower business taxes, less regulation, lower minimum wages, reduced government interference in, in the economy.
there are many ways government can reduce the costs of doing business. These are some examples of supply side policies that could be used to increase aggregate supply and counteract cost push inflation. Now, we're not going to get into the evaluation of these policies today. These are policies we're going to examine in much more detail in future lessons. But for now, we have introduced some of the solutions to demand pull and cost push inflation. The goal, of course, is to reduce aggregate demand during a demand pull inflation or increase aggregate supply during a cost push inflation. In this lesson, we've also outlined some of the consequences on different stakeholders of high inflation, the uncertainty it creates and the impact it could have on investment and economic growth, the fact that inflation wipes out the savings of households and could lead to an inflationary spiral where rising prices lead to more consumption, which leads to even higher prices. Next, the impact on exporters. A nation's producers can become less competitive in the global economy as foreigners demand fewer of their goods due to the rising prices. The one winner of inflation is, is those who have debts that they owe. Inflation, in the same way that it reduces savings, also reduces the amount of debt that individuals have since the money they pay back is worth less than the money they borrowed. Here we go. One step back.